from Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS FM. Our special guest today is uh, Bill Bruford, a well known rock and roll and jazz drummer. Welcome, Bill. Great. Hello, and uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm very pleased to hear I'm somebody that matters. Oh, there's no doubt. Um, our format oh, here at the uh, our format here at the radio station we play um, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s uh, current music, and uh, and certainly a lot of the bands that you've played in um, have figured uh, among our uh, uh, our playlists here that we've used. Um, certainly, um, yes, King Crimson, UK, a short stint with Genesis. Um, uh, lots of different things, including your own solo jazz work. So if we might start back toward the beginning, um, when uh, William Scott Bruford uh, was born and was a young man, how did you first get interested in the uh, drums? Well, um, it's, well it's unusual, but um, uh, my sister had a boyfriend who gave her a pair of brushes, which are things you sweep around on, the, on a snare drum to make rhythmic patterns with and said, if you play these on a, on a thick card album sleeve, uh, it'll sound just like the real thing. And it did. And uh, she tried that and said, I don't, can't do this. Why don't you give it to my younger brother, Bill? Hmm. So, so I guess it was my sister who started me off. Wow. And uh, so you got into grade school, and uh, did you find yourself uh, in bands or in um, your room? No, it's a bit slower than that. I, I, I became immediately transfixed by great American jazz that I was seeing on uh, BBC TV um, regularly, Saturday nights, a 30-minute show, black and white, filmed and recorded beautifully by the BBC. So by the age of 12, 13, 14, I'd heard all the American greats. Uh, Art Blakey, you know, Max Roach, Sonny Stitt, um, all, all the good guys. And uh, I was transfixed by this and thought, this is a mystery. I don't understand how this works, but clearly the drummer at the back knows something that, um, you know, everybody else, he's in control of everybody else, and I like to look at that. So it looked great to me. Wow. So basically uh, you kind of wanted to... Uh, express yourself and have some control of the situation uh, and the rhythm and what have you. So yeah, yeah, and, and join join in generally in the mystery of jazz, which I didn't understand, and so I grew up as a jazz drummer. I see. So um, into your young teens, you kind of came into the jazz. You said that you kind of uh -huh. got your feet wet in American jazz, what have you. Uh, and how did you come between that point? Um, with jazz drumming and what have you, and pursuing your schooling, and to join Mabel Greer's toy shop. Well, that band you're referring to was only, I think, that for about a day or two before it turned into Yes. Right, right. Um, we had the privilege of interviewing um, your colleague John Anderson recently, okay. and he had mentioned about how he met Chris and, you know, Mabel Greer's toy shop. Uh, was together, and then John said that he said the name's too long. We must change this. That sounds right. Yeah. So, what was your perception of that time? Uh, well, uh, uh, e exciting, of course. I um, had no idea quite what I was doing, but then nobody did much. You just wanted to be join in in London in a very exciting scene. Everybody was in a band. Everybody was in a van going north up the highway system to play gigs of one sort and another. I didn't care at that time whether Yes was going to be jazz or rock. It didn't bother me. I, you know, Everybody was falling out of jazz into rock and around 1968. So it was a very exciting time. Right, right. So Mabel Greer's Toy Shop, you said, uh, was together for all so short a time and sort of morphed into Yes. And now you've, uh, a jazz guy, found yourself in a progressive rock band. How how did that feel? Uh, well, I'm not sure we were a progressive rock band. We started as a covers band. Uh, so we were doing material of other people, like the Beatles, every little thing she does, I seem to remember. Right, yeah, that was on the first album, eponymously titled Yes, I believe. And we uh, had material by the Fifth Dimension, American vocal group, Vanilla Fudge, Leonard Bernstein, little bits of Stravinsky and Sibelius were thrown in there. Um, and eventually, you know, we got tired of covering things um, and just started to form our, uh, you know, make our own tunes. It was relatively easy to do. 
Right. So the first album, as you said, had some cover material and things, and yeah. and and somewhat successful, and then moved toward "Time in a Word," which had more more yes, so to speak, um, and and the Yes album, which was, uh, in, in my opinion, in my youth, was a, a pinnacle of progressive rock and uh, and 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 Yes music. Uh, yeah, all, all, all that's true. I mean, the interesting point. I guess there is that it took a long time for us to focus what, on what we what it was we wanted. So, the Yes album it was no, so the first album called Yes, and then the second album were not successes. They didn't sell uh, any copies to anybody, uh, but we were slowly focusing in on what it was we were about, and we got real close with with the Yes album. Um, got even closer with Heart of the Sunrise on Fragile. Mm-hmm. which really became the master template song for Close to the Edge, which followed that. So I think it took four or five albums for us to find our feet. Right, right. So you had uh, found your feet with uh, you know other talented musicians, and Rick Wakeman was with the band by that time. I guess Tony Kay had, had fallen out. In fact, we had the privilege of interviewing Tony Kay as well. Um, oh, yeah. And... Uh, I guess whatever fell out, fell out, and uh, Rick Wakeman wound up joining and infused his, you know, classically trained, you know, <laughs> church organ style into things. Um, how did, did how did how did that fly with you as far as uh, the albums that uh, he played on? Well, just just fine. He was he was the hip young guy of the day. You know, those bands tended to revolve kind of a revolving uh, sort of evolve a revolving door kind of strategy whereby you know if you could find a better guy down the street then you'd ask him to join him you'd kick out the guy who was going to you know who wasn't quite so good so we changed wow. our guitar player for steve howe it was pretty brutal really wow keyboard, interesting keyboard player for rick wakeman who was the glamorous guy of the minute wow so, well he, he, he's still playing with uh with john anderson actually i saw them recently on okay. on tour where they did some okay. of the work that you had all brought together yeah, I, I, I mean, I wrote, if you're interested in the period, I wrote a a, 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 a book on this, and, and, and it's, it's quite a lot of the detail in this is covered in that. Great. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about the, the book then? Uh, this sure, might be a sure. good juncture. I, I wrote an autobiography uh, recently, two or three years ago, and it's just called Bill Bruford, The Autobiography, Ah. and it, it covers a lot of uh, the material that we're covering right now. Great. Well, that's good news for anybody that uh, you know has has interest and wants to move into that direction. So, had had by the early '70s, had Yes kind of played out for you? Did you feel that you had more, or you wanted to do more jazz, or what was your motivations and drive? My, well, I I you know I was a young player. I'd started at 18. By 22, I had some gold records on the on the wall, um, and things were going swimmingly well in that sense. Uh, on the other hand, I'd only seen you know four or five guys in front of me in my whole musical career. I'd only heard myself in one context. And the problem with just being in one rock group is that's all you're ever going to be, just the one guy in that rock group. Right. Um, for me, I had somewhat greater ambition than that, and I wanted to hear myself in the context of other musicians. And the other band of the day that everybody wanted to be in was King Crimson. Right, and, and, and uh, a lot was, of people they, were in it <laughs> at different they a, times. They had a different career arc altogether in the sense that they started with a massive, huge hit record called In the Court of the Crimson King. And, and much of the time, most people were looking at them saying, these are, the, these are the guys who really have this nailed. Right, and we actually had the privilege of speaking with uh, Greg Lake, another one of your contemporaries, and you know, to try to get the story of, well, how do you go from the tops with the first album, I guess, uh, into the sophomore curse, and how do you leave to form another band? And he said that the band had sort of broken up because of, I guess, pressures and things, and I don't know if yeah, Robert Fripp was yeah, hard to work with, but... That's pretty pretty much, yeah. King Crimson had a notoriously unstable existence uh, with people coming and going and, and permanently trying to find um, a correct musical direction. But it's in that kind of burning cauldron of... of um, personalities that, that, that you know you, you, you get a result that you can get albums that are extremely potent right um, and I think I think I was lucky to be on two or three King Crimson records perhaps Lark's Tongues in Aspic which was the first one I did one called Red which was much picked up by the grunge guys out of Seattle Kurt Cobain named it as being one of his favorite records so the thing sold through the roof 
um, Discipline, which was one from the 1980s. So I, I had some very inventive times with King Crimson, learned a lot about music there. Yeah, and certainly King Crimson, you know, as yes, you said, kind of had a had a door, and some people came in, and some people, you know, went out, and some people got kicked out, and it was interesting. We had the privilege, as they said, of talking to Greg Lake, as as well as John Wetton, who, after you know a successful career and being at the top with Asia, and twenty years of alcoholism and cardiovascular disease, had to. Uh, embrace health, had to embrace some medical procedures and turned around and has actually been touring with, with Asia. It, was, uh, it must be a very, very high, high pressure uh, business, uh, musical business. Uh, were you ever well, pressured <clears throat> to, to drink or yeah, to do you're, things? you're a medical man, you'll know about these things. Um, yeah, it, it can be. But of course, the way, the way each individual reacts to stress is different, of course. Some take it in their stride, some take it uh, extremely hard. Hard. Uh, funnily enough, I seem to have escaped most things, and, and I'm in good, hale, strong health, um, and happily retired from the music business now. Ah, I see. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about where where you're uh, what you're doing now in a moment. Um, you had also mentioned King Crimson, some very strong work. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting and and seeing some of your colleagues from the Discipline and Three of a Perfect Pair era. Um, uh, the bassist and uh, the guitarist from, from that time, uh, very, very strong musicians in their own right, are, are actually yeah. touring in uh, two of a perfect trio at the moment, uh, you know, Adrian okay. Ballou and what have you. So yeah. it was a, a very uh, interesting, interesting time uh, musically as well. I think Discipline uh, was a very, very strong record. Um, at the same yeah, me time... Too. Me, me I'm, too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so yes, yeah, so discipline was very, very strong. I thought musically, uh, as well as at the time, uh, were you dabbling at the same time, or what was the story with with UK with uh, John Wetton? Oh uh, well, uh, many stories. Uh, um, where to begin? This would be about 1976, I think. John approached me. We'd both been in King Crimson. We were out. Uh, it was Robert was having one of his downtimes on the band, and the band was loose. We were just free, John and I. He wanted to get um, a pop rock guy, Eddie Jobson, who'd been with Frank Zappa's group, in on violin and keyboards, uh, and very much a pop oriented guy or rock oriented guy. And I thought, well, I'm more of a jazz guy, and I'm heading more in that way. So why don't I hire Alan Holdsworth? who is a very, very good guitar player now living in California. And if, with a bit of luck, we'll have a couple of jazz guys and a couple of rock guys, and the thing might balance out. Right, and um, what was your perception of, uh, of UK? I know of uh, two albums, the, UK and Danger Money, were the two that I had. Yeah, the first one was the only one I was involved in, and I loved it. I thought it was a huge success. Um, but right after success comes this next word, repetition, which is really difficult. Uh, whereby, on the whole, you're supposed to do more of the same. Or you're supposed to do it bigger, louder, and faster. Hmm. Or, or you're supposed to do it in more and more countries. Or probably all three of them. <laughs> um, so for me, I think I'm better as a personality in at the ground, breaking moment. And then uh, I'd rather move on and do something else. Right. So you had moved on to do something else, and we're with King Crimson and things, and then... All of a sudden, uh, in the 90s, yes, it had an apart period and um, came together as uh, Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, and, and, and what made you get back with them? I guess you had thought initially that you'd kind of done well, the most you could. Uh, again, and again, um, uh, oh, it's a slightly strange story. I mean, uh, these things are often misunderstandings. I, I, I thought John Anderson gave me a ring one time. We hadn't spoken for 20 years, I should think and said that he was doing a solo album, and I kind of thought that uh, I was going to be drumming on his solo album, which would be a great idea, because when you have a clear leader like that, you have a clear direction as to where the group's going, and that's where the music is going, and that's relatively easy. Um, it turned out that as we got on the airplane to go to Montserrat in the Caribbean, that the other guys on the plane were also Rick Waitman and Steve Howe, so the whole thing was beginning to look like a kind of yes reunion. Yeah. 
uh, the album ABWH, we had a lot of fun with, and I think it had some real moments. And just for a little window there, a little tiny opening, I thought there might be, we might be able to breathe some fresh music into these guys, you know, and that it might all be okay. But rapidly it went off the rails, I think, and it turned into a massive union tour, which was all quite fun for a summer, but not, not, there was nothing particularly creative about it. Right, so you felt that it went from Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe, or ABWHs, I guess we all called it, who were fans at the time. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it had, a, like you said, the window was open, and, and then it kind of went back into the yes, but formulaic, like you were saying before, rehash, louder, and more countries, and just uh, kind of bit, again, more, again. A little, bit, a little bit like that, yeah. We, we, we got on fine and had a fun summer, but I don't think anybody particularly wanted to pursue that line having two guitar players two drummers two kind of west coast california yes and a european yes kind of pushed together in a rather awkward way i don't think anybody particularly wanted to continue down that for too long right right and the, and the two guitarists were, were were quite strikingly different i mean as their careers strikingly have played out different differently and, and i don't think that, i don't think that would work terribly well they're, they're both great guys you know but, but there's no need to have two right 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 um people need a little space sure and then um, in the 90s, I guess shortly thereafter, um, you got back together with uh, King Crimson and did some work with them. Uh, well, yes, I've been in and out of rock groups, but I've also been in and out of jazz groups. By this point, I'd already formed my own band. Was it Earthworks? Uh, uh, yes, Earthworks, mm-hmm. which, was, which was running through the 80s with um, some young British guys. Uh, and that's been enormously important to me. So I was going, blowing to and fro, hot and cold between rock and jazz. Always the guy who was too rock for jazz and the guy who was too jazz for rock, you know. Wow. Well, was uh, it that jazz was your real love and that rock and roll kind of paid the bills? Or what was your view on it's that? It's not nearly as simple as that, Craig. Oh, okay. <laughs> would, <laughs> what would you say? Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice if it was quite as simple as that? Um, rock, has, rock is fun, but it has all sorts of problems. Uh, number one, I've told you one of which is repetition. For me, that's the biggest problem. Um, you know, once you've, you've made a lot of people a lot of money, they want you to keep on doing the same thing. Sure. Uh, the great thing about jazz is that it's free and open to invent and push things forward on your instrument. You have to bear in mind that I'm not so interested in Yes or King Crimson or Earthworks or jazz or rock as I am in the development of the drum set. So what people do on a drum set today and how they may do it tomorrow are my concern. Ah, I see. They may not be your concern, but they are my concern. Right, right. So I'm interested in groups in as much as they permit me to research that. So you're interested in pushing the drums as far in directions that interest you as Absolutely. they could go. That's pretty fair to say. That's what right. you're paying me to do. You're paying me to think up the drumming that's going to happen tomorrow. Right, right. Well, what that's are your... We, that's partly why we thought we were sort of progressive musicians. Right, right, right. Well, what's your um, thought on, on guys that are um, uh, inspired like Neil Peart of Rush? for example, over his 40-year career? Um, he's done wonderfully well, hasn't he, Neil? He's done done really well. I don't know his music personally, but I'm, I'm sure it's extremely good because everybody tells me it's good. Yeah, he with his roles and his fills, he's, he's like a machine. He doesn't miss a single beat. I mean, you know, occasionally drummers, will, if you're mu- musically inclined, you might notice a little miss or something, but he's just uh, un- unbelievable in that way. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, there are some brilliant players around. And, yeah, uh, who, who who do you like? Who inspires you to push well, your drums? There'll be, there'll, there'll be lots of names that you don't know. Sure, um, well, that's and, fine. And that you you might know them tomorrow if, if they ever make any music that will surface um, and, and arrive at your radio station there. Right. So if I say Asaf Circus, or I say Gary Husband, or I say Mark Juliana, they're names that you might remember, uh, and hopefully you'll hear something... Uh, cross your CD player sometime. Right. Well, actually, Gary Husband, it's interesting you mention him because Level 42 has gotten back together, and, and he, as part of that band um, uh, with uh, Mike Lindup and um, 
Okay, good. And and the other gentleman in the band um, was just fabulous. I mean, they were the most tight. I mean, Mark King, their bassist, is one of the most phenomenal slapping bassists, but people don't know his name, and maybe they'll remember the pop song from 1985, Something About You, but they don't. They haven't followed his career and seen what he's done. And, and I saw them rather recently. They crossed the big pond, as you would probably say, for the first time in 18 years. And they were fabulous and they were tight. And they were one of the best acts I've seen. But it's interesting that you do mention Gary Husband. Gary's a wonderful jazz player. Yeah, so so he's he's to, got the same conundrum that you have, sort of, um, being pulled? I, I'm not even sure it's a conundrum. I mean, I mean you know, many actors... Uh, go to Hollywood and play in a James Bond movie and get paid more money than, than they need to be paid. And then they come back to the UK and they play in the Royal Shakespeare Company for a whole lot less money than they should be paid. You very quickly learn in the performing arts to get paid for doing what, way too much money for doing almost nothing and almost no money at all for moving heaven and earth. So you get used to that. Um, it's the same with drummers. You live halfway between jazz and rock. Right. So it's so you said there's the commercial if, if world, and then player, there's if the... you're any kind of a player at all, you'll you'll need to express yourself in something other than the basic rock beat. Wow. Okay. Well, that's well, that's good and interesting information. Um, can you tell us about um, Earthworks in the 2000s till 2007, till just before your uh, oh, drumming sure. retirement? I mean, great. Uh, well, what kicked the band off in the 80s was an electronic drum set, the ability to play chords and samples and all kinds of strange percussive confectionery um, on a drum set, which was uh, amazing. The drummer could play chords uh, from keyboards via MIDI, and this was all new technology. And uh, we formed a group around that specifically so that I could play kind of tunes off a drum set. Um, that pertained through until the, until I, uh, the band reached about ooh, uh, 97, 98, um, at which point, uh, technology had moved on so far, but was also becoming extremely unreliable and very hard to ship some of that stuff around the world at jazz club level. Uh, the band turned more into an acoustic band at that point. It's always used, really, um, UK musicians, very talented UK musicians. Um, and we toured the States quite a bit and uh, up until about 2007. And I think the band's last live album was, was cut from the Iridium in New York City. Great. And, and what would you recommend for someone that has experience with you rock-wise, like myself, and uh, potentially to get more of a flavor oh, of you jazz-wise? Would it be the earthwork stuff? Easy. That's incredibly easy. What you do is you go to my website, Bill at Bill sorry, uh, BillBruth.com, um, and you click on store, and you start listening to stuff in the store. And then you buy the Winterfold collection, which is blue. And that's all effectively rock stuff. And, or you buy the Summerfold collection, which is yellow, which is effectively jazz stuff, making it real simple. I mean, obviously, in my world, jazz isn't always jazz, and rock isn't always jazz. Uh, rock isn't always rock. Right. But um, if you want to get a handle on what I'm doing, all, all, all I can say is much simpler than me telling you down the phone is just click on BillBruford.com, and it's all there. Right, and that would be uh, the best way to uh, to move sure, on to sure. experience you your work. There you'll see, and you can click on music and listen to it and see what I'm up to. Right, and, and more recently you've uh, been on tour in the States as far as like a spoken and book tour? Well, yes, I had a rather successful book that came out a couple of years ago. I was just telling you about uh, Bill Bruford, the autobiography, which rather surprised everybody, including me, uh, and particularly including my publisher. Um, and it is indeed about my life, but only in so far as it supports, I hope, uh, interesting observations about the musical life in general that's applicable to uh, other musicians as well. It's not all about drumming. It's about life and music generally. And I think we'll entertain people who want to know about that particular world, which I consider to be hugely misrepresented most of the time under the famous sex, drugs, and rock and roll banner. Right, right, right. You understand that that is now a caricature, the end result of which being you get Keith Richard. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> which is a but, sad end result. <laughs> you will also understand there are people who are not Keith Richard, like me, 
Right. Perfectly ordinary guys who have a perfectly uh, adequate interest in music and are, try- are doing a good job of moving things forward and bringing you music. Right. And, and, and what's next for Bill Bruford? Where does Bill go from here? Well, I, I'm, I'm currently um, an undergraduate research student at my local university here in the UK, Surrey University, studying uh, at uh, doctoral level notions of creativity and the drum set. Wow. Very interesting. Um, student or teaching or both? <laughs> I'm sorry, did you say student, teaching, or both? Um, I'm, I'm not teaching. I'm not quite a student either. I'm a research student. Oh, okay. So you're, uh, you're working on trying to push the instrument and the art as far as it can go in your lifetime. Yes, I, I think that's a fair way to say it, that, that I'd like to contribute to the drum set. Now, I started doing that in around 1968, or tried to, and have hopefully... Um, while entertaining myself enormously, I've hopefully pushed the instrument itself forward a bit. The, the, what, what you expect from drummers, how drummers do things, what they can do, how they do it, why they do it, all that has to be pushed forward, and I believe I've assisted marginally in that. Now that I'm no longer on tour and don't waste my life in airports anymore, mm-hmm. the best way for me to do that is to research it at doctoral level so that eventually I will be able to offer the drum community a well-researched um, postdoctoral thesis on creativity in the drum set. Great. Well, we'll all look forward to that, Bill. Thank you so much <laughs> for spending time with I us here it. today. Well, it's, it's a pursuit. You know, life is about the pursuit. It's not uh, so much the end as it is the journey. Uh, I and think that's exactly exactly in a happy, philosophical way to, to end it. Well, we, we do indeed try. Um, so for anybody that wants more information on uh, Bill Bruford, certainly he has a 40-year career in music in both rock and jazz and uh, uh, other ways that he can push the drums and advance the science and art of drumming forward. And so you can go to BillBruford.com uh, as find out uh, more about his music as well as his autobiography. Um, This will wrap it up for this edition of Interviews with the Musicians That Matter with Bill Bruford. We're only here on Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM.